Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for our machine learning class here. Um, and in this video, we're gonna be looking over logistic regression. Um, so this is um, from the end of uh, chapter four here of our hands-on machine learning textbook. Uh, we'll look at the sigmoid function. So the differences between logistic regression and linear regression is basically applying this nonlinear sigmoid function. Um, but, but we'll look at that, how it's used as a cost function, talk a little bit about plotting decision boundaries. So we've seen some examples of this before for classification problems, but plot our decision boundaries and then talk about how you ex can extend logistic re regression to work with a, a multi-class problem. So using softmax regression, okay? Um, so, like I said, this is from our hands-on machine learning, um, kind of the, the last part of chapter four here um, on uh, training models. So we're going to be looking at logistic regression here. Um, so, let me restart, clear everything out here so I can run everything. All right, logistic regression, um, in my opinion, is maybe a bit misnamed, just mostly because when you start learning about machine learning, the first thing you learn is, you know, what are um, supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. And then within supervised learning, you, you talk about either, you, you know, training a model to do a regression problem or training a model to do a classification problem, right? So. Logistic regression actually um, is uh, useful for classification problems, despite what its name says. Um, the name comes just because of the history of, of how it was used um, and how it was developed. So, you know, we're kind of stuck with it. But I, I mean, I almost always think of it as logistic um, classification, you know. So, so doing classification with the same... Um, weighted sum that we did for linear regression, but we're applying the logistic function to it um, in order to uh, in, in order to solve classification problems. Okay, but I'm jumping ahead a little slightly a bit here. So, um, so the the base form of a logistic regression is the same as a linear regression, um, just slightly modified, um, as we'll look at. So. The first thing, so, so uh, we'll start off by just talking about a binary classification problem, okay? So, so initially, um, let's just restrict ourselves to, uh, we want to do a classification problem using this method of logistic regression. Um, so uh, it's a binary class, so there's either, you know, um, the, the, our supervised learning, we're, we're trying to train it to give a zero or a one output, right? That's what our binary classification is. So, the first thing, um, since it's a classification, we want our output to be a zero or one, right? And um, if we allow it to be like a real value number, um, we have some, um, some issues right away, okay? So, so we'll start by considering binary classification. Um, um, and, and, and it starts the same way, so we're computing a weighted sum, but then instead of outputting the output directly of that weighted sum, which is what we did for linear regression, and that was our hypothesis, uh, we're going to put it through a function. This, this, this small, this is a little sigma, Greek sigma here. But that meant that, that's meant to represent our um, logistic function here. This, this function has several names, uh, the logit, the sigmoid, Okay, um, and but it, but it's just of this form. This is the standard uh, sigmoid function here: one over one plus e to the negative z, and and e is a constant. So this is uh, Euler's number. Okay, so like like pi, it's just it's just a, a constant. Okay, so we're just raising this this value to two point one out whatever. Um, you can find that value if you want to. It's it's in the um, uh, NumPy, so it's 2.718 to negative e, okay? Um, so, or as you can see from here, uh, I mean, we can use like np.e 
e raised to you know five to raise e to a power, or you can use the um, exponential function, which is doing the same thing. Okay, so hopefully, I mean, I know that sometimes trips people up, uh, but but the exp function um, is basically doing the same thing as raising e to some power, whatever you give it to, uh, whatever power you ask it to raise it to there. So. So, actually, they should have been exactly the same, so I don't know why. I mean, down to the, they're basically the same, right? Down to the almost as many digits of precision that we have here, so. Um, okay, so the first thing to note, if you plot off the logistic function, so again, z is our input to the function, and, and then we're plotting out the results, so notice what it does, what, what this function does, um, no matter how small, how negative or how positive your value is, it squashes the output after putting it through the, the, the sigmoid function into the range from 0 to 1, right? Um, so, so all values, no matter what they are, when you do the weighted sum, get transformed into the space from 0 to 1 by going through the sigmoid function. Which is, you know, useful because um, so if we want to do classification, um, if we specifically we want to do binary classification, the output target is going to be either a zero or a one. So now we, we've restricted our range after doing our weighted sum, whatever the theta parameters are that you know. Uh, but then whatever output we get, we, we map it now into a value between zero and one. Right? This is a nonlinear mapping, which is kind of an important um, uh, uh, difference for how. Uh, a logistic regression can work, all right? But, but we won't talk about that right now. Later on, um, but and and the 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 name sigmoid, um, I believe, kind of comes from the shape of this. It's kind of like a lazy, flattened S here. Um, so sigmoid, the name sigmoid is related to that kind of shape. Um, so yeah, so, so no, no matter what the weighted sum is, we get a value between zero. And if it's really, really negative, we get a value basically zero, or very close to zero, right? And if it's a big positive number, we get a value close to one. And if we're things, you have to be close to, you know, around negative three to three before you have anything that's significantly different from zero. And, and I guess another thing to, to point out is that the point where um, this changes from less than 0.5 to greater than 0.5 is at z equals zero. So, so at zero, the, the function is exactly 0.5, right? Because we're going to use that as the threshold. So effectively, and again, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but effectively when we use 0.5 as our threshold, um, so er everything below 0.5 will, will end up predicting as a zero here. So I'm, I'm talking about this part of the notebook. Uh, if we use 0.5 as a threshold, and, and everything that's above 0.5 we'll, we'll predict is the one class, right? And by using a 0.5 threshold, that means effectively the weighted sum, we're using zero here. So, so if the weighted sum ends up being below zero, we're going to predict the zero class or the negative class. And if the weighted sum ends up being positive, um, we'll predict the um, one or the positive class here, right? All right, so given this um, modification of our weighted sum, putting it through the sigmoid function, we need to not talk about the cost function, okay? So we need a slightly modified version of the cost function. Um, so, I mean, in particular, I mean, even without going through the sigmoid, we would always have this problem because for a classification problem, our, our label is either a zero or one, right? So we want the cost function to be um, how far away we are, you know, so, so how bad our prediction is in terms of being a zero or one, right? Being, being the positive case or the negative case. Um, so, well, so, so I mean, that's. Um, Kind of another reason why this, you know, squashing it through the sigmoid function makes it so that we can use a cost function like this. Okay, so anyway, th this is the definition of the cost function we're going to use for logistic regression, um, and this is what's known as a piecewise function. So for all the cases where y is one in our training data, we use just negative log p, where, where p is the output of the the, the sigmoid here, right? P 
he had. Um, and then for all the cases where y is 0, for this binary classification, we use 1 minus p hat, the, the log of that, okay? So, I mean, if you look at the shape of this function, let me just plot both of these out here, you should be able to understand why these make sense as a cost function, okay? So here is the case for our piecewise function when y is 1. When y is 1, we just take the, the negative logarithm of p, okay? So again, remember, p is the result of coming through the sigma function, so p can only range from 0 to 1, right? And if you map negative log of p from 0 to 1, it looks like this, okay? And again, remember, this is for the piecewise function for the positive case, right? So think about this a moment as, as in terms of being a cost function. So what they're saying, if the true value, it, and, and remember, we want to minimize the cost, right? So when the cost, uh, when, when we're predicting a 1, and, and it actually is a 1, we end up with a cost of 0, which is what you want. You end up with a low cost or, or a 0 cost. And, and, so, and again, the, 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 the truth is that, that it's a 1, right? So the closer we are to predicting a 1, you know, the, 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 the better our prediction is and the lower the cost is. But if we're predicting, so if we have a probability or a prediction like 0.1 or, or 0 0.001 or something like that, when it really is a 1, right, we're making a bad prediction. In that case, we want to have a high cost associated with that, right? So anyway, make certain you understand that. So, so this, this cost function totally makes sense um, for our binary classifier here. So for all the cases, where it, it really is a 1, we want to have a, a 0 cost when we're predicting it's a 1, and we want to have a high cost when we're predicting it's not 1. Or, we're, we're, or you can think of this as a probability. So when we're given a very low probability that, that it's a 1, that should, that's a bad prediction, and it should have a high cost to that prediction, right? Um, and if you plot for the other piece, y, the 1 minus p, you get basically the same function and the same argument, just mirrored, right? So here, it's, it's, in truth, it's a 0. So if, we're, if, if our probability is 0, or, we're, you know, we're predicting 0, um, then um, you get a cost of 0. Right? And, and if, if it, it really is a 0, but we have a, a probability that's a 1, you know, or, or we're predicting that's a 1, you end up with a high cost, okay? So yeah, make certain you, that you see that. So given that definition, this, this piecewise function here of our cost, right? Um, so as usual, you know, it, it doesn't help us to just, call, to just calculate the cost for a single training example. So uh, if we want the, the, the cost for some set of theta parameters, we need to average it over all of the items you know, so we have m items in our training set. We need to average the cost over all the items. So you go for a particular theta. You have to go and c calculate the cost for each one. Um, this is a little bit of mathematical trickery here, but but uh, you know, hopefully, if you, if you look at this, think about it for a bit, you'll see what's happening. Because by multiplying by y here, the, and so y is either zero or one. That's the true label. So for the ith instance, if y is a zero, this would just uh, drop out, because zero times whatever would, would be zero, right? You'd just be left with this. One, one minus zero is just one, right? Um, and that corresponds to the, co the piecewise cost function, you know, the negative, one, negative log of one minus p, right? Likewise, if y is a one, one minus one becomes zero. This just drops out, and you end up only with one times this expression. So you end up with the, the piecewise function for the y equals one cost, this one here. Okay, so anyway, right? You can you can you can sum this up. So this is similar to what we did for the the, the sum of the squared errors for our uh, root mean squared error cost function. So we're taking the sum of this um, logit cost of our sigmoid probability here, right? But but anyway, you just sum those up and 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 divide by m to average, and and we actually took the negative. So, so both of these were the negative of the log, right? So we kind of factored out negative 1, so that's why it's negative 1m over here. So, um, so that, I mean, that's a, a, um, an expression for the cost function. As, as, as we discussed a little bit here, um, 
There's no known sort of solution to this, so you don't have an equivalent of the normal equation for the logistic re regression, logistic classification, like you do for linear regression. But this is a perfectly good cost function, um, and this cost function is known to be um, convex, like linear regression. That means that we can use um, optimization methods. So any optimization method, like gradient descent that we talked about, can be applied to this, and, and as long as your learning rate isn't too big, and as long as you iterate it enough, um, uh, you can follow the gradients if you can calculate them um, and find the theta that minimizes the cost function, which will be the, the theta that gives you the best predictions um, that, you, that you can get according to our derived cost function here. All right, and it is possible to um, to derive the formula for the, the gradient of this. Um, again, it's being a, bit, a bit beyond the scope of this class of, of how you derive this formula. But one thing we should point out here, you should go back and uh, compare this um, where, where we showed the, the formula for the gradient for linear regression. And you'll see it's exactly the same. The only thing that's different is, is we, we still have the, the, the sigma, the, the sigmoid. So in, in the linear regression, it's just, um, you know, the, the weighted sum minus y um, times the xij, right, for the gradient, right? That was the result of taking the derivative of the square, the, the, the square difference. Here, and this is one reason why we, 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 we picked the, the, the sigmoid um, and, and the logit function, the, the derivative of this comes out to basically the same expression, just you, you take the weighted sum run it through the sigmoid um, and, and take the difference of that with with the answer, right? So what that means, though, is that basically, if you wanted to implement gradient descent for logistic regression or, or uh, linear regression, um, you, you, you can use it almost a, exactly the exact identical code. And the only difference is for logistic regression, you just need to do your weighted sum and then put that through the sigmoid. Um, but then after that, the rest of the calculation of the gradient is exactly the same, right? So I, I didn't recreate that in, in this uh, textbook, but you, could, you should, in theory, be able to take from our previous um, lecture notebook uh, our function for calculating the cost and the gradient. Um, well, the, the cost will look a little bit different, but, but the gradient will be pretty much exactly the same function, just uh, have to apply the sigmoid um, at the right place. All right. Um, so I mean, yeah. So this is a good result here. So at the end, because we can find the the formula for the gradient, we can apply an optimization, um, and and then the same arguments apply. So that allows us then to search through the theta parameter space for any um, problem that we set up um, and find the ones that minimize that cost and give a good decision boundary um, for our binary classification problem, all right? All right, um, so let's look at decision boundaries. Um, so we looked at these before. So um, the best way to visualize um, a classification problem, any kind of classification problem, is to determine and plot the decision boundary that the model produces, all right? So the decision boundary for like a linear model which logistic regression is still a linear model because we're taking a linear uh, weighted sum here. So, so we're not using any nonlinear kind of term um, in the weighted sum. So you end up with um, a line or a plane, um, a, a linear plane or a, a line that, that's going to be the boundary between, for the binary classification um, case, it's, it's the boundary between from where we predict zero to where we predict one. That's what the, the decision boundary um, represents, okay? So like we've done before, I mean, you can use a um, contour plot uh, to do that. And, and so if, if you calculate the, the, um, um, the values of the, uh, the, the output of this um, sigmoid, uh, or ex basically what you want to do is plot the, the p hat, right? If you, if you plot that over your um, feature space, 
um, and then you find the, the place, the, the boundary where that goes from below 0.5 to above 0.5, that would be your decision boundary because, again, below 0.5 you predict 0 and above 0.5 you predict 1, right? Or, you know, you don't even have to, to go through the, the sigmoid because, you know, basically you can just use the weighted sum and, and if the weighted sum ends up being negative uh, for, for our simple binary classification, that is going to be where our sigmoid uh, ends up being below 0.5. So that's another thing, kind of another simple thing you can do to find your decision boundary um, for logistic regression in this case. Okay. So let's just plot it. Um, um, it might be easier to look at. It. So uh, in the simplest case here, so for our first one, and, and again, I'm just using kind of the example from the textbook here. Um, we're going to be using um, a well-known data set. Uh, this data set actually is a multi-class problem because there's actually three classes. Um, so the, the, there's three different types of flowers of irises in this data set. Uh, their names are Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, right? Uh, but we can, we can make this into a binary classification problem, which is what we do here. So we class, uh, we're going to turn it into um, trying to predict whether it's Virginica or not Virginica. So we collapse the other two cases into just it's not Virginica, the, the one we want to do. And we further simplify, so we only use one. In this case, there's actually four separate features. So sepal um, is a part of the iris, so sepal length and width, and then petal is another part of, of a flower, so the petal length and width. But we only use one, so we use the um, the the petal width here. We could have done this with any of the features to illustrate this, right? But by using a single feature, that means our decision boundary is just going to be a single. Um, it's not really even a line; it's just a point. Um, so at, at at this particular point on petal width uh, is the boundary between where uh, you know after we do our training, and this is you know we, we fit a logistic regressor um, to the data set here, um, to our reduced data set where we're just using a single feature, um, and we're doing a binary classification of Virginica, which is the green, and not Virginica, which is the blue here. Right? So in this case, you actually end up with a decision point, uh, which was one point six six. Right? So everywhere below that, the, the train classifier um, gives a prediction of less than 0.5. So it's going to predict the zero um, or, or the, the negative case, which is the not Virginica. Right? And everywhere above the 1.66, um, the probability will be 0.5 or greater. So it will predict one or Virginica. Right? And you can see that these are the the, 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 the blue squares and the green triangles are actual instances of the Virginica and the, um, the, the other two classes here. So the other two classes range from, like, I, I say it down here in the lecture notebooks, um, so um, from like about 0.2 or something up to 1.8 um, or 1.7 or something like that, or 0.1 to 0.18. To, to 1.8 there, right? So, and, and the, the Virginica ranges from about 1.4 to 2.5. So they have bigger petal widths in general, but there is some overlap. So given just this one feature, you can't make a perfect predictor because, you know, some, some of these overlap. So, so you can't distinguish between these two. Although, again, you know, that's the reason why normally you want to have more date, you want to have more features because maybe you, even though you can't do a perfect predictor with one feature, maybe if you had two or three or four features, um, uh, you could use the additional information on the other features um, to distinguish between these values that are overlapping here that end up being classified incorrectly according to um, this simple classifier that we built. All right. So anyway, yeah, 1.66 is the, the threshold, so you can use the predict function from a scikit-learn uh, transformer predictor. So, so anything above the 1.66 threshold should end up given a prediction of 1, and anything below um, should end up given a prediction of 0, basically. Right? Um, 
Again, so, you know, I mean, a point decision boundary maybe doesn't illustrate it very well. So, um, I mean, at least let's look at it with two features so that we have, uh, uh, so we can see what the decision boundary is um, um, in a two-dimensional space, right? So here we'll use the, the pedal width and the pedal length this time. So we're using the last two features, but we're still doing the Virginica, not Virginica. Uh, classification, right? And here, uh, kind of as we have done before, uh, we'll use a contour plot, right? So, and, and we're just plotting the um, the probability. So, so, so we ask our train classifier to predict the probability over a grid of our features, um, you know, the, the pedal width and the pedal length features, right? So again, th this probability is going to be a number between 0 and 1. And then if you plot the contour lines, we can find the, the, the 0.5 contour line, and that would be the decision boundary between the, the, the negative and the positive class here for this binary class figure. So, so anyway, I mean, these lines were from our contour plot, so these were probabilities. And you'll notice they all do end up being lines. So again, because of what we're doing right now, uh, we're going to end up with a linear model for this logistic regression because we're doing a, a, a linear weighted sum of the features, right? So, um, um, so these would be probabilities, and then if you find the one that's 0.5, that ends up being your decision boundary, okay? So if you look at pedal length and pedal width, you get this line here, um, our decision boundary, um, and you can see again it's not completely perfect. So there's, but but even with these two points, there, I mean there's two here. It's a little bit tough to see if you blow that. There's there are two points and pretty much like right on top of each other, uh, it, just in this two parameter space, pedal length of the wood. So again, you you really can separate those two points very easily. Um, unless we have another feature, so so maybe they're separated on, on like a third feature, but they're pretty much right on top of each other. Um, but yeah, so it, but we end up with two points over here, which are incorrect on the decision boundary, and, and we get uh, one, two. So I think there's a, the only two here and two here plus uh, one of these is, is incorrect as well. The the blue square, um, the not Virginica. So we have three incorrectly on this side of the decision boundary and, and two Virginicas incorrectly on this side being classified as not, right? But, you know, this is the best decision boundary that we can do using our linear um, logistic model here that we fit to the data on these two parameters, right? Um, and again, of course, this is our, this is our um, performance on data that we trained with, so um, as we talked about previously, you know, you wouldn't really want to, to, to use this as a measure of your performance. You'd want to do something like a cross-validation and see how it does on untrained, on, on data that wasn't trained with, that kind of thing. So. All right. Um, so everything we talked about up to this point was uh, we were using a, um, a um, binary classification task as our model. So you can extend logistic regression to multi-class cases, uh, multinomial um, cases, right? Uh, you can do it in the same way that we discussed before. So you can just, just train separate logistic um, classifiers um, and then take the maximum, so, so the one that ha ends up with the highest probability, um, um, you take it. Um, but um, an alternative approach uh, that more directly does this, although, again, you know, I should point out that it, it, it is similar. We are actually building separate classifiers still, but we're combining them with the soft mass softmax function, okay? So we'll, we'll run into this again. So this, this has become um, a fairly standard function, not just for logistic regression, but um, other things. So, so applying the softmax to the, the result of an output that you can interpret as some sort of a probability estimate for multiple classes, right? You just apply a softmax, um, and, and then you take the, the maximum after applying the softmax function, you know, which is what argmax does, um, and then that's the class among the multiple classes that you'll pick, all right? Um, so, yeah, I don't kind of go into here. So the result, though, of applying 
the soft max function is, is kind of like normalizing. So we're just summing up all of the separate probabilities. So they get summed. So to, by dividing this, you end up um, re um, you end up putting this into a new kind of probability space. So basically, you end up with all of the um, outputs of the softmax function summing up to one, okay? So now you can interpret all the individual scores after a softmax um, um, transformation um, as the probability that it's that particular k class, okay? So again, k represents, we have, we have k classes, capital K is the number of classes, so, so like for the um, the iris data set uh, we have k would be three we've got three classes the setosa uh virginica and um and i'm blanking on the third but, but but we have three different types of iris flowers right so k would be three and this is the probability we're, we're calculating using the softmax the probability that it's the, the class zero class one or class two of, of the three classes there right or class one two three depending on whether you start at zero or start at one so here, here it would be class one, two, three, um, since we start at one um, here. Um, so anyway, you can directly use the the softmax function by simply, um, so, so just think of that as the probability of, of our multiple classes, right? And that, so then you can have a, a cost function that's basically the same as what we just developed for the binary classification case. So, so if you look at this, so when k is 2, this actually reduces to exactly what we had before, um, um, if, if you kind of figure it out, right? Uh, although, you know, it's not... It's not perfectly obvious because before we had pk and 1 minus pk for the two cases. So the, the, the transformation of the softmax function ends up doing the same thing as doing the, the, you know, the, the differences with result to being the zero class or the one class for, for the binary case. All right? And if you don't completely follow that, you know, you don't, it's not really that important. Um, you know, so anyway, you can end up with a, a perfectly good cost function now. Um, and, and so this will work in general, no matter how many classes you want to perform a softmax logistic regression on, you know, three, four, ten, whatever, whatever K is, right? So, oh, and I just noticed I probably should have been a little bit more consistent. Uh, and in one place, I, I, I did a one base, and then I did zero base here, um, which is not good. So I should go back and fix that, be consistent there, so. Um... And believe it or not, I mean, you can figure out an expression for the gradient of this. Although, again, this just reduces to the same expression for the gradient that we had before. Um, or pretty much, uh, you know, the, the probability here, though, you know, we're going to be using the, the softmax function. Um, so, you know, our, our sigma isn't just a straight sigmoid. It's, it's this, which is slightly more complicated than, than the sigmoid, um, but um, similar idea, right? So, so again, the only difference between this and linear regression is that our probabilities here, um, you know, it's, it's not just a simple weighted sum transformation, it's a weighted sum, and we put it through uh, an additional, in this case, the, the additional softmax function here to get the probability. So. Um, So, anyway, if, if you want to use a softmax regression, um, it, it's a little bit hidden uh, to do it in scikit-learn, uh, but it is, it is available just as the standard, in the standard log logistic regression uh, class. But if, if you ask for a multinomial, um, for this multi-class parameter, it is basically using what we described here, softmax regression. So like we did before, we can um, 
plot the contours of the, again, you know, so now we're doing um, a multinomial or a multi-class classification. So we're doing it over all three classes this time, which I didn't point out, but, but, but we're basically using, you know, class zero, one, and two. So our, our three different flower types. So, but you end up actually with um, uh, uh, linear boundaries, right? So, so we have we have one boundary here, and we have one boundary here, basically, um, that uh, that separates uh, that, that that ends up giving different uh, decision boundaries between our three classes in this case. All right. All right, um, so yeah, that's basically it. So um, uh, we looked over all these things. Um, th th there's some things that we didn't do again, um, which, you know, maybe we should because, so all, all the stuff that we talked about for linear regression in terms of, you know, applying gradient descent to it and um, um, what else, and, and, and other things like that, I mean, those all apply here, right? So, so once you've gotten the... Uh, formula for your cost function and you know are able to calculate the gradients um, then you have a, a similar sort of optimization problem even though you're doing a classification now instead of a, a regression okay so so you know you should just understand that that uh, and, you know all that stuff that we talked about for linear regression applies here now and in in, in, in similar ways for the different machine learning mechanisms that we look at after this and, you know, after linear and logistic regression as well, um, um, most of the times we'll be specifying them as a cost function that we can optimize. So. All right, so that's basically it for um, our discussion of logistic regression. So at this point, after getting through Chapter 4, we've really got kind of all of the, the uh, tools that we, that we need, so the kind of the concepts to then look at the details of of other machine learning uh, models and, and how they you know how they differ in terms of their cost function and, and optimization and other parameters and things to to use with them. All right, so that's it for this video, and I will see you guys then in the next video.